Close your eyes, focus on the breath. Watch it coming in, watch it going out. You might try some good long, deep in and in and out breaths to begin with. And then notice if long breathing feels good. If it does, keep it up. If it feels tiresome, you can change. Make it shorter, more shallow, faster, slower, heavier, lighter. You're allowed to play with the breath. In fact, it's an important part of the practice that you do play with it, because that's how you learn cause and effect. It's like learning a musical instrument. You don't learn all about the theory. But unless you try different things on the instrument, you don't know what gives a good sound what doesn't give a good sound. And when you figure out what gives a good sound, then you can take use, make use of that knowledge. It's the same with the breath. You work with the breath in different ways. You talk to yourself about the breath in different ways. You find what works, what doesn't work. And then you can use what works as a tool in getting to know your own mind. This way of dealing with the breath was something that was rediscovered by John Lee passed on to Ajahn Fuang, and almost didn't make it to us. There was one time when Ajahn Fuang was commenting that he didn't see anybody else in Thailand who was teaching the Ajahn Lee method anymore, not even in Ajahn Lee's monastery. He said that, and chills went up and down my spine, because we almost missed it. But it was because of him that we were able to maintain this practice, learn about how the mind fabricates its experience, by the way we focus on the breath and learn about the breath. So it's good every time this time of year rolls around, which is the time he passed away. Then we think about it, John Fuang and all, but then we owe it to him. Without him we wouldn't have what metta, we wouldn't have this place to practice. So dedicate your practice today to him. What does it mean to dedicate your practice? You make up your mind that you're going to do this for the right motive. As he said, the purpose of the practice, whatever you're doing, whether it's generosity, virtue, meditation, is to purify the heart. Because our heart has lots of greed, aversion, and delusion, more than we'd like to admit. But this is the way of taking the, the heart and cleansing it, purifying it. If you have stinginess, okay, you cleanse it by being generous. If you're careless, don't care about other people, well, you t start taking the precepts and you learn to care. You learn to care about the consequences of your actions. Because the opposite of the precepts, on the one hand, is acting in a harmful way, and the other, Opposite is just not really caring about the consequences of what you do. You just do what you want, without thinking about other people, without thinking about what it's going to do for, to you as well. But when you practice the precepts, that makes you stop and think. By actions, what kind of consequences are they going to have in the long term? And then you try to avoid any kind of harm. That way you become responsible. You become more of an adult, ready to meditate. Because if we just stop with Generosity just stop with virtue. The rewards are good, but they don't last very long. And then we're often back where we were before. And sometimes the rewards of generosity and virtue can get misused if you don't have meditation to train your mind to have a good sense of what, what's skillful and what's not, what's proper and what's not. So it's the meditation that makes things complete. And that's what really purifies the mind. Because it's through meditation that you learn to develop your discernment. And it's your discernment that's going to allow you to see through the greed, aversion, and especially the delusion that swamps the mind. You see, the greed doesn't really get you anything that would be long-lasting, and aversion doesn't gain anything that would be long-lasting. You have to learn how to recognize delusion for what it is. And you do that by acting on what you think are the best possible motives, and then noticing while you're acting in those ways, what are the actual consequences. If it turns out they're not good, okay, you've learned chipping away at your ignorance. So all of this is to purify the mind. Keep that in mind as you practice, that you want your practice to be complete, and that it really does have a long-term end, a long-term consequence which is really good and that doesn't change on you. That's what John Fung said he owed to John Lee, which he showed him the brightness of life. John Fung was born in a poor family. He was orphaned at an early age. And looking from the outside, you wouldn't see there was much future for him. But he met a monk who was able to teach the Dharma in a way that captured his attention, captured his inspiration. And I was able to lift himself out of his narrow environment and become a teacher to other people in Thailand and a teacher to other people in the world. 
So that practice is there. It's available for all of us to do, all of us to practice. So take advantage of the opportunity while we have it. As he was always saying, once you're born, you're entering the line to die. You don't know where your position is in the line. It could come soon, it could come late. So you better practice right now.